All right, we're here with Rob Borowski, who's a professor of anthropology at Hawaii um, Pacific University, and you're also the director of the Center for Public Anthropology. So first of all, thank you very much for having us here in beautiful Hawaii, in your beautiful home. Um, we'll talk about a list of issues. Um, so first of all, welcome. Okay, thank you. I'd like to say welcome to the students who are watching this. Um, it may seem unusual that um, you have to watch all these different programs to get a sense of anthropology, but some of it will be very exciting. I'm not sure if what I say will be exciting. You have to decide that. But really welcome, and I hope you find some food for thought here. All right, thank you. Um, so first of all, maybe if we start by, by asking you about how did you get interested in anthropology? What was your pathway to becoming an anthropologist? Well, I have two brothers and a mother who got PhDs in psychology. And here I was, a student at Union College in New York. It's connected in New York. And I was thinking, first of all, what could I do to get away from New York to some other country? To, uh, England was perhaps my choice. And I thought, well, what are programs at different places? And I thought, oh, I applied to Irish archaeology at the University of Dublin. I applied to um, various other ones, psychology at Bristol, and I applied to anthropology at University of London, University College. And I got into University College, and so I went and I t worked with Mary Douglas and Daryl Ford and Peter Echo, and that seemed interesting. Then, when I was graduated, I was going to go into social work, and I liked the idea of being able to travel different places and doing social work. And then I had some real reservations about that, so I applied in anthropology. And I definitely did not want to go into psychology because my two brothers and my mother were in that. So I decided that um, I would try anthropology. And what kind of anthropology were you working on at that stage? Uh, <laughs> I was clueless. Um, I just thought, uh, to, I was interested in psychological anthropology because of my psychological background. And I was just really exploring um, the idea of living somewhere else and what that might be and engaging with differences because, as I said, I'd been a student, what was called an occasional student at the University of London, and I traveled around Europe and I really liked the sense of traveling. I used to look at National Geographic and think, and, and Uncle Scrooge comic books. In between those two, I mean, you get all the sense of adventure and excitement. And that's what drove you to anthropology. And where, where did you do Uncle your... Scrooge comic books drove me to anthropology, <laughs> that's I must admit. <laughs> um, and, and who were I you... I owe it all to Huey, Dewey, and Louie. <laughs> um, and, and who were you working with at that stage in, with, for your graduate work? Um, I go because I didn't have anyone I really worked with. And one of the things I suppose I should say, since we're being somewhat honest, um, is I was at Brandeis University. I had gone there, but I didn't feel I fit in. And we'll get, I guess, to what is anthropology. And they kept on saying what I was doing was not anthropology. And I got very nervous, and I wasn't sure how I fit in. Um, and I worked with Ari Keefe, who was a psychiatrist, but I worked with maybe Bob Manners and um, some others. but. I really didn't have anyone that I worked with, and it wasn't like some systems where you could work with one professor and focus on that. But I certainly felt marginal there, and I failed my doctoral exams. Okay. The, yes, I failed them twice. <laughs> but that's, that's a good news story for people who might not be doing so well <laughs> right. at the moment. There, there, yeah, there's yeah, hope. You, yeah, you, you may still to, become yeah, a professor. Yeah, yeah, you have to imagine this young professor who starts teaching and is somewhat nervous and tries to impress the students if I can. And I never told them I had failed my exams. And then I was talking to someone and said, oh, no, no, you should tell them. It makes us feel better. <laughs> it makes you human. <laughs> and so, well, OK. So I tell them, and it says it makes me really have an appreciation for the underdog. I have an appreciation for really trying to help people and really empower students and not just simply be into myself because I understand the vulnerabilities of that. So I went to um, Brandeis, left, and became an elementary school teacher. All right. And so I focused on teaching a lot because of that. But I had a problem, and that is that I didn't have a college. As an 
And as a elementary school teacher teaching fifth and sixth grade, I would tell the students to be quiet, and they would only occasionally be quiet. When I tell college students to be quiet, they are almost always quiet within two or three minutes, maybe five. But they, <clears throat> that happens. Um, so I did that for two years, and then I thought, really, I did want to go back and get my PhD. So I taught as an adjunct in Boston. And then I got married, and I took a 10-month honeymoon through Southeast Asia. All right. Yeah, so we thought we'd do it up with class, you know. Okay. Um, and so we did that, and then I got into the University of Hawaii. I, there I worked with um, Dick Lee Ban, I suppose you'd say. But I really worked on my own. I remember um, Tom Oretsky saying to me once, so he said, who do you really work with? I said, I don't really know Tom. He said, that's what I thought. I just went off and did my own thing. I quite liked Doug Oliver because he had a sense of standards and high quality, but I just sort of was feeling my way trying to do things. And what were you, what was your PhD on? Okay. <clears throat> I'm standing in front of a um, bulletin board at college, and I'm trying to think, what am I going to do my doctoral dissertation on? And <laughs> I don't know what all these students there, or you or others think, but I was a little clueless. And I knew, since I was a little nervous from that doctoral exam stuff, feeling that I had to really try and do something well. And it just struck me looking at ethno-history. I thought, oh, that would be interesting, comparing how anthropologists who wrote about the past, what they wrote about the past, and how these people who worked with them thought about that past. So I would compare the past as the anthropologists portrayed it when they were there, and how people now recall that past. And I lucked out. I, it took me a year to find a place. And I had various people, Margaret Mead and um, Pospisil, um, trying to discourage me. Um, Margaret Mead said, oh, you don't want to go to where I went. Oh, you don't really. It's just no, no, no. And then when I didn't go, she said, oh, good luck on your work. And Pospisil said, oh, you don't want to go to where I work because um, it's in the middle of warfare. It's very dangerous. Some of my performance died. And besides, I'm going back there next year. <laughs> So they were discouraging, so I decided I had to go somewhere where there was field notes for someone, but they were dead. <laughs> dead men don't object, if you will. And so I went to Puka Puka in the Northern Cooks, and that turned out well, and I stayed for three and a half years. But what was interesting was they were there in the midst of a cultural revival. They were reviving what was called an aqua tower system. Now, there had been five anthropologists there before me, and none of them had recorded this aqua tower system. And I looked at the historical records, and they hadn't any statement about it. So the question was, were the Puka Pukans inventing a new tradition? Or had the anthropologists aired and not recording an old one? And the answer is both. That history for Polynesians, for these Puka Pukans, um, is always changing. They're always adapting it to make it alive in the present. That it doesn't seem just out there and stuck past, but it's something, if you're going to make it meaningful to you, you have to bring, bring it up to date and you have to create it all the time. And these anthropologists sort of frozen in the past that this was what it was then. And so, like for European history, they did that. They said, oh, this was happened there. But if you look at the New Deal in America, that's always changing now. It happened, but we find new records on it. They have new interpretations of it. Lyndon Baines Johnson, who was seen as a miserable president in 1968, um, we decided not to run, is now seen as really effective because he did the Civil Rights Act, he did the, all these, the New Society, all these wonderful things. So history is always being updated, though we don't always admit to it. I think that's a, a perfect segue to, to the question about, you know, to someone who hasn't heard much about anthropology, how would you define anthropology? And I think history is, a, is one of those elementary parts of anthropological work. We right. always... Most theses start with uh, uh, you know, an introduction that includes a historical stock take and then right. perhaps a, uh, another interpretation to add to that stock take about right. the people we write about. What I'd like to say to you and to the students, it's not something that you just check off in a multiple choice test. Mm. If you're given a question in this MOOC or in some other test, what is anthropology and you only have five choices? They're so all I, wrong. I can't do that now for the students. Well, you'll do what you want. <laughs> That's not for me to say. But, but, I, but <laughs> um, 
I don't want you to think it's this definite thing. And to be honest, I'm not always sure what anthropology is. I work in the Pacific. History and anthropology totally overlap. Um, it overlaps with sociology, it overlaps with politics and economics. Okay, but let me, since you gave me this question beforehand, and I could prepare a little, um, a sense of three ways to look at it, three definitions, and I'll let you or I'll let the students decide which one they like best. Okay, the first one, and it relates to history, is start with someone like Henry Louis Morgan. He was a scholar gentleman in New York State, and he worked in the 1860s. He did some field work among the Iroquois, but he wrote all these books, and he didn't care if he was an anthropologist. He didn't view himself in this way. He was a lawyer. He made his money through being a lawyer. What made people into anthropologists, sociologists, economists, political scientists, um, was going into the university. Here was a bureaucracy and they had to have all these little boxes. And it was very exciting for some people in the middle class because they would get paid. They would get a job. They didn't have to go out and get a real life and real money and they could just be paid teaching. And so, but they had to define who they were and what they were. They had to have this neat definition. So they would define themselves in a certain way and that would relate to the context of the other departments, and, they would, and there'd be a verbal definition, but they'd also be sort of how they adjusted and what they taught versus some other courses. Now here is a key anthropological principle. The context shapes behavior. So if you're in one context, you may well behave in one way, and in another context, you'll behave in another. For example, when you were young, or students when they were young, they might act one way in their own home in a different way and maybe more polite in the home of a friend. But in different contexts, people behave differently. So what happens is people, anthropology and how it's practiced may be practiced in one way in one context, in one university, and in a different, con in a different university in a different way. And let me give examples. If you go and look at how the courses in different universities, across the United States or across the world, you'll find all sorts of different ones. I teach a course on managing our mortality, which is about death and dying, about how people transition, their own transitions, but mainly the transitions of the parents, how they'll cope with those, which is a very traumatic thing for many students. So how will they deal with that? We talked about that. Is that anthropology? <coughs> um, I deal in a course on the viability of democracy in the modern world. I started doing it when democracy was very hot. It's a little less hot now, as you know. Um, is that anthropology? As you know, a famous anthropologist studies debt. And a very famous economist studies inequality. Are all those anthropology? Here is a definition for this first one that I came up with. If the chairman of your department or the department itself says it's anthropology, and if it's taught, by a professional anthropologist, in other words, they have a PhD or whatever credentials you need. If it's taught by a professional anthropologist and it's in an anthropology um, department, who is to say it's not anthropology? Anyone on the outside would say, oh, that's anthropology, because it says anthropology 303 or something. But there's so many things that could be anthropology. And some people say, they're all anthropology. It's all mine. I'm going to take all of it. That's fine, but then other people in, in economics will say, it's all mine and take all that. And so they have all these different things. But one way to define it is simply in terms of what each university defines it as. And you'll find different people doing it. So if you want a consistent answer across all these universities, you won't find one. Okay. First definition is just what makes sense to the people in a particular context teaching it. Take another one. Anthropologists do study individuals. They study, um, and there's some wonderful biographies and informants, particularly um, Native American informants. But they by and large study groups. And the question is, what do these people within a group share? Are they all alike? Are they not? And this, and 
anthropologists came out of a European tradition <coughs> that said in the 19th century, the mid-1800s, say, they were forming up nation states. They had like England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, which are now seen as just one unified country. By If you're not in Britain, you might see it. But um, you see it as a unified country. These were quite separate with quite different tradition, quite different rituals and beliefs and so forth. And what brought them together, according to this Yale historian, Linda Coley, was the Napoleon Wars, the fighting against the French for over 100 years, the conflicts, they were got unified in the 1800s, and there was a sense that, oh, they're all unified when they weren't fully. And because they read newspapers now at this time, people in Scotland could know what was happening in England, in London. And so they came to have some common conversations, some common experiences, but they were quite different. But they called this a culture. They all shared a same culture. And I don't believe culture exists, but many people do, they believe, and the problem is whether all these people in a group share the same beliefs, share the same behaviors, hopes, dreams, what have you. And that's problematic, they, don't, they assume it without checking it. But so people, well, another definition you find in textbooks often is that anthropology is a study of culture this non-existent belief, but tries to say that people within a particular group act and behave alike. And because c people in different contexts behave differently, the group in this context will behave this way, another group in that context will behave differently. So people in the Cook Islands, in Tahiti, will behave differently than Papua New Guinea, than in Malaysia, and so forth. So there are all these differences of how people behave. I've defined it in one book I wrote as saying variations in beliefs and behaviors across time and space. So it's just really the variations. We don't have to get into this culture and this stuff and, that I'm not sure so about. And there are no about. clear delineations, which in early anthropology were sort of set up at some degree, but these days it's all about the, those transition zones, right? Right, it's, it, all these transition zones. And What's interesting is because the Europeans, I didn't say this clearly perhaps, Europeans viewed other groups in terms of their own nation states. They made them into unified wholes and beliefs when these nation states weren't themselves the same. Not all English were Anglicans, not all French were Catholics, and so forth. And so there's all this ambiguity, but they try and impose an order. So when the students get this definition in a textbook of it's a study of culture, I would at least scratch my head and wonder who's being included in, or what's being included and what's being left out. Mm. Now, my favorite definition. Third one. <laughs> Third one, okay. It's a bit romantic. It fits with my 10-month honeymoon. Okay. Um, anthropology is like a calling, it's sort of a passion in which it's like going to university. You live in a world, you grow up in a particular world in which you, um, certain things are expected of you, you know how to act and all. And you go to university and you see all these new things, all these different behaviors, all these people doing some things that you never heard of or thought of. And you engage with this difference. And the question of your own integrity and character is how do you engage with these differences? Do you just dismiss them? Or are you open to learning about them, or better understanding them? and saying, what can I learn from them? And trying to find a mutuality with them. Um, one of the key points of anthropology is I said, that context shapes behavior. And so anthropology is to understand what may seem exotic behaviors, understand the context in which people behave. And so this idea of understanding how people live in their context, understanding the differences from us, and what we can learn from them and what they can learn from us, how we can help them and how they can help us, is really sort of sense like a calling. It's a passion that allows us to really enrich the lives of those around us as well as ourselves. Almost sounds like you're referring to The Gift by Marcel Mauss ah, in terms yes. of this, this interaction yes. um, that binds the anthropologist with the people he or she works right. with. You don't watch Washington Week, but what happens when they say one of these words like this and 
um, the, when I felt the main um, moderator turns to the camera and says, and the gift is, means this. The gift just talks about, from Marcel Mouse, the um, nephew, I believe, of Emil Durkheim, um, the founder of sociology and a key figure in anthropology, um, talked about how a gift is never free, that you give something and there's an obligation to return it in some form or some way. And it always establishes a relationship between right. the, the gift giver and the, it, the right. recipient. Right, and that you, and that becomes the key. The relationship is the key. The item isn't as much as doing a relationship. I'll give you an interesting example. One of the things that I quite like, because I like engaging with difference, is working with the people in the city and county of Honolulu in terms of various projects I do. Many people hate them because they're bureaucrats and they have these set rules and so forth, you have to go, but I like them. But you cannot give them a gift beforehand. That's viewed as bribery. So you can't say, I would like to have this and that done, and here's my gift to you. That is very bad form. But after they say yes, they may say no, but eventually, hopefully, they will say yes. After they say yes, then you can give them a gift. And the point is that you may well come back again another year and they'll remember you. So there's a tie and a continuity. So gifts establish relationships, but you can't just give them immediately or so forth or formal. You have to think of them as a way of establishing and continuing relationships. And anthropology is really that with these people. It's sort of almost a vow of trying to help and learn for both of you collectively. I, initially, I had a vision of having everyone we interview come up with a very short one sentence, anthropology is, but that's very difficult, and I think it's part of the, the message, right? Yeah, I will give you one sentence definition. Okay, great. Go figure, I have no clue. <laughs> Nor should you. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's an evolving question, I guess, and I one think always it's has to re-question oneself how, one, how we are doing what we're doing as anthropologists and, and why we're doing it. Right, and I think we should not have the sense of the hubris, the arrogance, saying, oh, I know this definition, this thing. It's an ambiguity, but that ambiguity, like love, can you define love for me? Not in one sentence, no. Okay. It's the idea is that it has ambiguities, and those ambiguities are very enriching. So the ambiguities of anthropology that we discussed are very enriching mm. and thought-provoking and insightful. Mm. Um, in terms of anthropology and um, how, we, uh, how we do what we do, um, one question is, what do you consider the core mission of anthropology as a discipline? It strikes me to develop a mutual relationship with the people that I work with, if I just say for me for the moment, not for others. Develop a way in which we both gain from our sharing, like a relation, like love and so forth. Um, though you don't always love every informant and they don't always love you. Um, but there's a sense of trying to have meaningful relationships where you can learn about them, you can gain things. And this, of course, advances your interests because when you write a dissertation, I was fortunate to get my fir the first book I did, it was dissertation published, and I was just unbelievably ecstatic. It was just the greatest thing since sliced bread. But when you look at a book, it's like looking in a mirror, and after a while you get bored, so I had to go to other books, okay. But the idea was that I wanted to do something and have it published and enhance my career. But then shouldn't I do something for them? And so I did something in return and helped them with a dictionary project that they wanted help on. It wasn't for me to decide how to help them. And so the core mission of anthropology is a mutual sharing, this idea of engaging with differences in a way that can be insightful and enriching for both parties. To a layperson, <laughs> what public anthropology is, what, what its mission is, Okay, there's a certain hypocrisy in this. In that, I can't really define anthropology for you, 
So <laughs> I'm supposed to be able to define public anthropology. Maybe not define it, but tell us what it's about. Okay, yes. Okay, I'll be glad to do that. <laughs> I don't, I actually have a little definition that I practice here. But um, the idea, let me see how to explain it. Let me give you a context of how I developed it. I wanted to do a book series with the University of California Press and on this sort of vague topic of activism, public affairs, and these things, and didn't know what to call it. And applied anthropology, unfortunately, I think, has this negative image among many mainstream anthropologists. I think it's quite unfortunate and quite unfair. But so I thought, well, I should do something else. So I coined this term, public anthropology, because there's, there's a public health, there's a public history, and I then have tried to figure out over the past 20 years, I guess, what it means. Let me give you some ideas. I take two senses of public. The first is um, to make something public, to uncover it. Um, it's this, a, sort of a critical pedagogy, I think you might call it, in which you try and open up and explain to others certain things that they might not know, they may not understand, um, exposés, if you will, or something that um, uncovered. Like what I said about showing that Pukapukans continually evolve their history to keep it up to date, and anthropologists have taken this sort of 1800s, 19th century view of history and frozen in the past. To uncover these things and these dynamics and to bring these to public light. That is very common among anthropologists. They bring all these things out. They show all these things. There are exposés. Um, Nancy Shepard Hughes is a wonderful example of this of Philippe Gua. And they show how all these things happen. Or Paul Farmer gives a vivid account of the suffering that people go through, the poorer people, and the problems with their health. And you think, wow, that should change people. But it doesn't. Many people don't change. They say, yes, we're sorry. Yes, it's unfortunate. And then go about the business. The second sense of public tries to present this, publicize this information in such a way they can actually transform social institutions. And I'll give you some examples in a bit. But the idea is, can you not only uncover important information that helps explain dynamics, but can you then actually change those? I'll give an example for students. Why does college cost so much? I haven't yet to see someone who thinks it's they should charge, well, administrators think they should charge more. I have yet to meet a student who thinks it's, they it's should too charge. cheap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't think that happens. Um, and so what I've done is I've explored that. And there's several variables, but let me just highlight three. One is that colleges keep on raising the tuition, their specified tuition. It's like 500% in 20 years or so. But many, two thirds of the students don't pay that in America. They pay a discounted rate. And for about five or eight years, the rate, because of all these discounts, the actual tuition wasn't going up. The, the standard tuition was going up, but the rate wasn't. And this was sort of a little bit of um, marketing. Because the idea is the more you charge, the higher quality you are. So I, Gerhard, I say to you, we normally charge $60,000 for you for all our students, but we're going to give it to you at 20000 Okay, and you think, this is great. Someone else is going to make me pay 15000 but I could get this $40,000 discount, so I'll go there or something. So it was a way of, try, of marketing and trying to draw students in. Also, though, in the 18, 1980s, under the Reagan administration, there was a sense that college wasn't simply a public good, the principle on which the University of California system was founded, that they are having all these educated citizens, going back to Thomas Jefferson, was a very, as a social good, but it was also a private good that students were going to make all this money from going to college. And so 
that students go into debt, $23,000 or $24,000 in the United States these days, when they graduate, was okay. They would earn it up. But there was a change of, um, of political ideology because the government was running out of some money and they said, no, students should have to pay their own way because they're going to make this money later. And the other one is the colleges don't really know how, how to process all this information. They can't really calculate how much money they need. They aren't sure how many students are coming in. They're not sure what the costs are going to be and they're very variable. And so they don't know. So they charge whatever the market will bear. So we have these different reasons, the marketing, change in political ideology, poor accounting, and they just don't know what they do. So they just try and get whatever they can in parents as well as substance. Public anthropology should look at that. They should see these underlying things. They should understand this and they should convey to students. But that's not enough. Many anthropologists just go out and say, hey, you should know, Gehad, that you're being screwed by college and that you know they don't really know what they're doing and maybe you should go to a place that charges you much less though they look like they're charging more. The challenge is then to use anthropology and the tools of anthropology to really try and change something. And I have a project for that. The question is, are you really giving students the skills they need to succeed later? If you make public the marketing strategies of charging so much, and yet you know only a third of the students are getting screwed, two thirds are getting okay, but if you make it clear what is going on, if you question the political ideology, you get colleges to be more precise about their accounting, you can maybe bring down the cost of college. The president of the United States is saying to these colleges, whoa, where's all this money going? What are you doing? And they hate it. They say, no, we can't do this. We can't do that. Oh, it's just impossible. And yet they're changing. And the idea is the more you bring out these behaviors, these um, sometimes untoward behaviors to the public, the more people get embarrassed and will behave better. A basic anthropological principle, we'll show you the camera, is that people behave better or more morally in public than in private. And so the result of this is that if you can bring this behavior to the public eye, to members of Congress, to the students, to the media, then yes, there's a better chance that they will change. So public anthropology not only tries to uncover behavior, like the cost of college, but then helps to facilitate a context, a structure that will help change it for the better, for the common good. So the focus is on benefiting people, not just trying to proclaim something. Does that help? Uh, yeah, and the anthropological toolkit you mentioned, what are the tools? Um, are you proposing anthropologists go and work, or more anthropologists, some are already doing it, work in these in institutions to uncover some of these uh, issues that you mentioned earlier, um, to do ethnography in um, a college, to see what student life is really like and, and, and how it could be different. Um, right. There is a book called My Freshman Year that you may know of. It talks about um, college and uh, what it's like as a freshman. And I showed it to my students, and I thought, well, I was really excited by this because it talked about they're not really engaging with other students, question what they were learning. And the students said, eh, I know that already. <laughs> I didn't know all of it, but maybe I knew it, but I didn't want to remember it. But what I'd like to do is you can't simply be embedded in a setting and be co-opted by the people who run it. One of the wonderful things of anthropology or of academics is that you have your own income separate from that organization. You often have tenure separate from that organization. And so what you can do is by being independent, you can be a critic or a supporter on your own independent judgment, not dependent on them, not part of the woodwork, not part of what they're doing. You don't have to support that organization because you're not getting your money from them. You can 
look at them and honestly, within your own limitations, but your own values, say, yes, this sounds right or this sounds wrong. Do I think colleges should be getting all this money not knowing what they're doing and just charging as much as they can and playing these games? No. And so I say that. And so I think students through anthropology have the opportunity to go explore all these issues that concern them about college, what they learn in school, about other events. They can go and investigate all these exciting topics. That's all anthropology, because as I told you before, it can be anything, it can be everything. So maybe just come back to public anthropology as sort of three main tenets of it. Accountability, transparency, and doing good. Could you just talk about those in right. a little more? Because I think in, in the example you've just mentioned, you've covered those points. Those right. points but okay, let's take transparency. Transparency, by the way, I mean is this uncovering, this critical pedagogy, or this idea of really opening up to the public what is going on. Um, Justice, Supreme Court Justice Brandeis famously said, sunlight is the best of disinfectants. He was a lawyer fighting these capitalist bankers in the early 1900s, and he was saying to get these bankers to behave, you had to bring their nefarious ways out to the public. In the idea in a democracy, you need to really open up with people's behavior and get them to be more moral by making it more public. More public usually means more moral. That's transparency. Accountability is that, yes, we have accountability. Um, in some ways, we get paid by universities. We get funds from taxpayers, like you or me or you. And we should try and do some good. It's not only about us. Let me take a different subject in which I'm talking about public anthropology and doing a project. And that is trying to understand what students learn in terms of critical thinking. There's a, two studies out, prominent studies, that say a third of the students at college do not improve at all in critical thinking, problem solving, or effective writing. That's pretty devastating. If you pay $30,000 a year or $20,000 a year, you go through and have a grand time, and you don't get the key skills that you need for your career, uh, what do you do? So the question is, are you learning that? That is accountability. Colleges and universities need to be able to demonstrate that they have that. And the politics should have to demonstrate that they're doing some good in the world. Benefits are a little vague here, and we'll get to doing good. But it seems to me that you should really be the focus of the discipline, should not be in publications but on trying to produce benefits for others, not just yourself. Here, I looked you up and I saw that you have various publications, but neither you nor I nor all the people that you're going to work with have, with total, they may be 300 public articles, 400 articles, I don't know. But say, each individual may write 100 articles, 150 at the most, if you look at an article as trying to put out a new idea, a new point, something significant to publish, that is a heck of a lot of ideas and, and being original. I don't know how you could do that. So articles just get churned out in a treadmill massively. So all these people are just producing these. What good is that? It helps their careers because they're judged on how many articles they produce. But are they benefiting anybody by those? And don't we have an obligation to help those who need help? Students, we should be helping to learn, get the tools to empower themselves as effective learners to grow. We work with people, and because I worked with the Puka Pukans and produced a book, I got a job. I'm able to write about them or about other things, and that advances my career. Am I the only one supposed to benefit from this in the spirit of mouse? or the gift, shouldn't they in some way benefit? And the poker is very clearly said, what's in it for me? Lopu, what, what do I get? And that is a good question in the sense that you have a relationship, that you need to do good. 
Now, good can be defined in vague ways, and you can have all these abstract intellectual arguments, but people are suffering around the world. There's all these problems, and we could try and do some good. We could try and help improve the human condition as we know it now. Anthropologists have these wonderful skills, the participant observation we have using the sense of context and how it shapes behavior and analyzing that comparison, the interdisciplinary perspective. And we're able, as a result, to really get some profound insights about people and how they behave. Shouldn't we use those to help others? Is it just a paper that some few people will read? They've done these studies of publications, and we'll ask you this. They've done this for elite universities. What percentage of the publication, what percent of the professors feel that their all their articles are read versus those that don't? That they just judge on quantity versus quality. Do you have an answer for what percentage? I don't I wouldn't I wouldn't know the number, but I can imagine a lot of people have quite depressing statistics to yeah. show. Fifty percent of the faculty at leading universities feel they are judged on their articles by the quantity, not the quality. Mm. Now you may not know what the what is quality and all these ambiguities, but the fact is people are a little too hog wild on publishing and a little less on benefiting others. So the idea of doing good is very important, that you really help others besides yourself. It's not just about you. People get upset about the capitalist image that you're just out for yourself when they like it when they benefit, but not when others don't. And we should be in this together. When you talk about doing good for others, how do you not define, but who are these others? Are they local stakeholders? So are they your students? Are they people in this community where you're teaching, where you're working? Are they the others in the field, the people you work with there? Both, because I can see some complications in, in what doing good can mean in different... It's like love. It's complicated, but take what you want, choose what you want, and try and do something positive. You, if we take this issue of doing good versus no harm. So do no harm is one of the ethics um, of the, presets of, the, of most um, associations, anthropology associations around the world. I think it's pretty debasing, to be honest. The actual Hippocratic dictum um, says, help, or at least do no harm. Why couldn't you help others? I don't mean going down the street and handing out dollar bills, because you can't do that. You don't have enough money. I remember being in Puka Puka, and this radio um, operator said to me, hey, Rob, you're rather rich, you have all this money. And his name was Kalito. I said, are you out of your mind? I'm a poor graduate student. And he smiles at me and he says, is that right? I said, yes, you know, I'm really poor. And then he says, well, what are you doing here? <laughs> and the idea is that from their perspective, I have a lot more money. I think that's realistic. But um, I can still do good. I help them write a dictionary. More importantly, I've kept a relationship with them. I send them fish hooks, which is, 81 to 2004, um, so over 20 years, um, 20, 30. Uh, <coughs> um, years we, I've been working with them and sharing this. My daughter is now there. That gives a deep bond to these people. That life is about relationships as much as anything, a deep anthropological principle. The relationships count. We should prize these. We should be helping others as best we can with our limitations and theirs. Not giving them everything you want. But it's like love. It's you work out a relationship. Hmm. So all you need to know you learn from falling in love. That's anthropology. <laughs> <laughs>